Today, I'm really pleased to be speaking with Bart Copeland. So Bart is the CEO and president of Active State Software since 2006. He's got a passion for building and delivering enterprise solutions that just work. Uh, he's also been involved in numerous uh, M&A transactions over the years, the most recent being the sale of the Active Stack Staccato business unit to Hewlett Packard Enterprise. He's also an angel investor who loves the intersection of technology, business, and the enterprise, and working with individuals and teams who have great ideas but need maybe a bit of support on the business mindset and perspective to get them to the next level. So, uh, hello, Bart. Give us a wave. And just a reminder to the audience, if you've got any questions for Bart during the session, just drop them into the chat, and we'll come to them. I've got some questions for Bart at the end, but enough from me. Uh, Bart, let me hand over to you, and perhaps you wouldn't mind by starting off, just give us a bit of an introduction to you, your backstory. Tell us about yourself. Well, um, so I'm an engineer by formal training, uh, but I probably practice engineering more in my co-op studies than I actually did after graduation, because at the heart, for me, was my passion for business and building businesses, but when I was young, I noticed a lot of engineers doing a lot of things not related to engineering. So I figured, hey, it must be a pretty good degree to have because you could basically do anything you wanted. And I don't say that in an arrogant way. I just say that the, the engineering mind allows you to tackle almost anything you're interested in doing. So I've had a passion of running companies um, and investing in businesses for over 30 years now. Um, and But I've really loved the software industry, and I love the software industry for fundamentally the key reason is the people. You are working amongst peers. Um, I started a manufacturing um, uh, early in my career, manufacturing businesses, and don't get me wrong, you know, wonderful business, wonderful people, but the, in, the working in software, the quality of people that you meet each and every day is just invigorating. Um, that's one reason why I love software. The other reason I love software is you have no cost of good soul. Uh, I love the idea of running a business where you don't have to worry about inventory uh, and you don't have to worry about supply chain. The number one thing you got to worry about is your people. Um, and so that's, uh, so I've been really in software now and high tech for over 20 years and I love it and it just gets more and more exciting. So that's kind of a quick backstory of me. That's awesome, Bart. And, and speaking as someone who used to be responsible for supply chain in a manufacturing company, I can say you made the better choice in life, sir. <laughs> um, so, so let's uh, unpack that a little bit more and, um, and specifically focusing on the bootstrapped journey because there's so much uh, attention and focus paid to uh, raising money and it's a really important part of, of the tech industry. Um, but bootstrapping doesn't get as much attention. So tell us uh, what it looks like to be successfully bootstrapped and why you think it's important to be aware of that as an option. Yeah, and I think I, I'll, I'll start with I had no choice in some respects to bootstrap. And I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit. Uh, but I'll, I'll, I'm going to explore this from two perspectives. But the reason I'm very passionate about bootstrapping it's because it's 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 what i really know i i although i have i am an angel investor and i'm an lp in certain funds and so my money is being, being deployed the venture capital way it's um for me and and how i've grown over the years is the bootstrap model and i just wanted to share you know, with BC Tech, hey, there is sometimes a different way and bootstrapping is not necessarily a bad thing. So I just like to share with, you know, our local community, there, there's a lot of goodness in, in bootstrapping, but you need to make sure you're uh, deploying it correctly. But so to go to my story is that uh, I've had the privilege of leading Active State now for well over 15 years. Um, got involved in 2006. I think what you need to understand is what, what does ActiveState do? ActiveState is a company built by geeks for geeks. 
And, we, and that's another way of saying we focus on developer tools. Well, back in 2006, uh, if you tried to raise money selling developer tools, people would slam a door in your face. Like developer tools, you know, that's, you know, that, there's no future in that. And it's quite ironic now, fast forward 15 years, when the developer tools space, the DevOps space, anything to do with software and, and CICD, oh my God, it's just like, it, it, and you guys have seen the valuations in the marketplace, whether it's Splunk or Datadog, or just this last week, JFrog, the multiples are insane. So we're all of a sudden developer tools are in vogue. But the point I'm trying to make is 15 years ago, they weren't. So what we had as a business was, okay, we can't raise money. And not that I necessarily wanted to, but we, I just uh, deployed a bootstrapping mindset. And so you, bootstrapping works if you have the right competitive landscape. And what I mean by that is if your competitors are highly funded or really big players, then you're going to have troubles bootstrapping. Uh, because they're going to have much bigger balance sheets than you, and you're going to have real troubles competing. But if you're in a space where you don't have that problem, then you get really, really focused as an organization because you live and die on the deals that you're closing. And because uh, if you close the deal, you put that money back into the business, and then you reinvest that for the next deal. Um, and so... And, and what it does, though, is that you're spending your time creating value that generates value for your customers rather than spending time selling a story to investors. And selling a story to investors is hard work from what I've observed. And I rather put energy into building the product, building the business, and not distracting myself. Um, so, and that's what you, and that's what you do. So, but I will, I will tell you a little bit of a story of active state to tell you when bootstrapping can work and when you can get into trouble. So active state's been through three chapters. I've had the privilege of uh, leading active state under chapter two and currently under chapter three. And I won't go through the whole story, but under chapter two, we had this core business selling to the enterprise. And it was uh, lots of free cash flow, and we were we were just reinvesting that free cash flow. Along came cloud computing, super intrigued with cloud computing, and we saw an opportunity to play a role in the cloud computing stack. And I won't get it too geeky about what that was, but there was a real opportunity around something called platform as a service, running uh, basically running your applications on top of the platform rather than doing it yourself. But we came up with an enterprise grade solution and we brought it to market. Uh, we started getting a lot of success. We started growing our ARR annual recurring revenue. And, but the players we were competing against were huge. And I came to the realization that we could can keep playing in this space, but these players could potentially squash us. But luckily for us, we were in a situation in the space at the time where we actually had OEM'd our technology to HP, you know, Hewlett Packard at the time before they were split. And um, they were using our technology in their stack as long, and we were also, while they were using it in their stack, we were selling our technology direct to a host of different customers. And the, we be started becoming quite strategic in the marketplace. And as a result, HP saw that and we had an opportunity because there were, HP was a gorilla in the space, although they had only amped us, for, there was others, there was IBM, there was Pivotal slash VMware, um, there was Red Hat. We felt like the space was getting too big and I didn't want to raise a bunch of money and I'll get to that in a minute why I didn't want to raise a bunch of money. Um, so we had an opportunity to do a strategic exit and we took it. And that concluded um, Active State 2.0. But the reason I didn't want to take a, a bunch of money, this is how, as many of you sh uh, know, when you raise money from investors, specifically venture investors, 
They want you to go big or go home. And so, and they don't care necessarily if you blow your brains out because they have 20 other bets going on in parallel. But as a founder operator, you have one bet. You don't have 20 other bets. So it depends the game you want to play. If you want to play a game where someone gives you a bunch of money and you either swing for the fences and you lose, or you swing for the fences and, and the probability of winning, uh, you know, we talk about doing a billion dollar company. That's hard, hard work. Uh, and the odds are against you, especially in BC. And I know we want to do it and I don't want to send the wrong message, but that the odds are against you. But there are a lot of good games to be played with smaller bets. And that's how I've chosen my career is actually doing base hits. And you could actually, if, it depends what motivates you, but if you want to make money, you can make more money doing base hits, doing singles and doubles, than trying to swing for the fences and uh, hit the billion dollar exit. So um, that's what caused me to do bootstrapping because there's a lot of money to be made bootstrapping. I'll say one more thing, Jill, and maybe then you can guide me because I'm going all over the place. <laughs> Um, is that for bootstrapping to work, there's a real simple formula, and it's, uh, it's called the 40% rule. And if you don't know it, uh, you can look it up. But basically, in its simple form, is that your year-over-year -year growth rate, percentage growth rate, plus your EBITDA percentage, your profit percentage, needs to be greater than 40%, 40% or better. If you can do that, you can grow organically meaning you can bootstrap yourself. If it's below that number, there's most likely you need outside capital. So we've been very fortunate to, over the years, uh, grow our business uh, or businesses with a rule of 40% of greater than 40%. So that is a good barometer. When you're doing your cash flow projections and everything, can you grow organically, sustainably? That's a good metric. And we use that. I, it's one of my fundamental KPIs we watch all the time. So, Jill, maybe just set me because I don't know if I've gone all over the place because the theme here is bootstrapping. I want to make sure I'm keeping on, on that theme. No, this is awesome, Bart. It's really golden. And I think the rule of 40 is, is key regardless, right? Like that's one of the key points. If you decide you are going to raise money, it's to get back to the rule of 40 one day. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to either increase your growth rate or your EBITDA percentage. It's not, it's not just to be bigger, uh, but the same. So uh, this is really, really helpful. I wanted to go back to something that you mentioned a little while ago and talk about the pros and the cons of that. So you were saying with bootstrapping, it works if you have the right mindset because you live and you die based on closing the deals that are ahead of you. And so I can imagine that that can work really well. It can make you be really intensely focused on the customer and on closing those deals. But I guess it could also be super stressful and anxious making. So talk us through that actual experience of living and dying based on every deal that you sign. Yeah, um, so one thing that I've always done in the businesses I've run, is I've, I've always made sure I have enough cash for one year. So if if, if my top line goes to zero, I have enough money to keep the lights on, take care of all my employees for at least a year. So I've always had that mindset. Um, and I think that's super important because if you don't have that mindset, then you become very, very opportunistic and you start just selling anything to keep the lights on. And that can be actually detrimental to your business. And, and so I've never been so stressed where I go, oh no, do I have enough cash to meet payroll? I've been very fortunate. Um, I've never missed a payroll in my life. Uh, and I know some CEOs that have, and I'm very fortunate I've never done that. And I don't think that's fair to employees. Um, but I've also been very fortunate that I've never had to run my business that close to the edge. Um, but when you say, what is the stress like? Uh, the, the stress that bugs me is stress when you're closing a deal strictly for revenue, but that revenue is not actually adding value to the long-term health of your business. 
That's the stress I hate. Is that if we close and we and I think we've been doing a pretty good job of that in, in, over the last 15 years. And we're trying to close business that is making our business more valuable. We've also been very lucky. Is all our, of our business is subscription. Even before software as a service was the vogue way of doing business, we were selling subscriptions to our customers. And so I think that's one of the reasons why uh, we were able to build a good runway um, to, to invest in our business is because we've been selling subscriptions for a long time. Um, so because if you're selling one-off deals, uh, you know, pro services, uh, that is harder. So when, you know, with the heart of your question, what is it like to live or die? To me, what it's like, when, when you land a deal that is truly making your business more valuable, even if you're losing money a little bit on the deal, but actually it's making your product stack more valuable, that is so rewarding. And it just focuses the, or, the organization, excuse me. Oh, and I see a, a follow-up question in the chat, which is great. So I'm going to go straight to that because it's a great follow-up to ask you right now, which is how long did it take for you to build up enough cash to have that one year runway? Because I can hear how sensible that is, but, but that's challenging too. So how long did it take you to get to that position? Um, yeah, without getting in too much in the weeds, uh, I, off the top of my memory, I think within six months to 12 months. There's something in, I remember when I started my very first business, we did some projections and everything and it was super conservative. Uh, and I actually, we, uh, I think we invested about a million dollars in the first business. This was, now, the, now you, this was bootstrapped in the sense the million dollars was a capital cost. We got um, uh, uh, some capital financing, but we were able to pay that off in six months. And was, we just totally exceeded our projections. And the point is what I'm trying to make is you just, you get the business running and then you're just hungry for revenue that makes the business more valuable. And that's, that's all we focus on. And that was kind of the mindset. And, um, and, and looking at the deals that are coming in and how do we turn those into revenue? And how does that revenue make the next deal even more valuable? Yeah, that's great. I've, I really, I'm, I always emphasize when I'm talking to companies, you know, every dollar you can get from a customer is worth more than a dollar right? Like it's because it isn't just the revenue. It isn't just the funding to keep you going. It's that real validation of what it is that you're doing. And anytime someone's hesitating to give you a dollar, that's a gift too, yeah. <laughs> because you can find out why, right? Yeah. So let's come to your other, another point that you made that I thought was wonderful. And I, I too, Bart, would love to see a lot of billion dollar companies, um, especially uh, BC based companies, but I'll be honest with you. I'd settle for seeing ten hundred million dollar companies. <laughs> I am a big fan of building the pipeline and building the medium sized bench strength that's going to help us, you know, win those bets occasionally when those billion dollar opportunities come along. But you're never going to build a hundred a billion dollar company if you haven't built a hundred million dollar company first. So yeah. let's talk about what it takes to get from startup to that more medium sized, you know, thriving, you've got tens of millions of revenues and you've got options. So can you talk us through that stage of your growth journey and whether there were some key points along the way where you realized that you could continue to grow, you didn't have to, you know, uh, curtail yourself too early on and, and what were those key insight moments for you? Yeah, so uh, I kind of break it zero to a million million to five and then 10 million to 50 million and i'm in the active state right now we're between the 10 to 50 million range um and that that for me as a leader that's my sweet spot i i don't i i personally don't have um a passion to run really big companies but i also as a leader i don't have a passion to do a startup from ground zero so every business that I've got involved with over the years, there has been a founder with a spark, with an idea, and they've taken it and got some early revenue with it. I like to get involved at about the million dollar level 
um, and then take it from there. I'm not, I'm not the, the garage type of startup executive or startup founder. Uh, that being said, I often say when you're zero to a million, there, is, there isn't a management team, it's one individual. And then from when you're one to five million, there's maybe one to two people that really understand the business. It's when you break over the five million, in my view, where you need to start putting a management layer in place and start grooming a team of executives uh, that are really what I refer to as an A-team. And that A-team, you, you groom, you nurture. Your job as a CEO, as you, many of you, I'm sure, here, is you've got to make sure the right people are in the right seats on the bus, including yourself as a CEO. You need to be constantly self-assessing. Are you the right person at this stage of the business? That's the right thing to do. Um, but as but, but my point is, when you're getting to come from the five million up, from my perspective, it's really now you're looking at the team as a whole. This team, it's I, I look at it as a single unit, the team. And I, I often say to my leadership team, the uh, the five of us, we have to be as one. If we are storming together in a good way because you should be storming if a, if a leadership team is all nicey and uh, that's not good You're, you need to be butting heads but in a good way then that team can take the business from 10 million to 50 million uh beyond 50 million i don't even want to go there because i i haven't achieved that myself so i i can't speak to it i would be just speaking vaporware and i don't want to do that so that's awesome. Okay, so maybe just to close off our dialogue, and then I'm going to turn to the chat and my audience, and, and I can see many listening attentively, so I know there's going to be some questions. But um, So bootstrapping isn't always uh, the right answer. So um, are there any indicators where you might say, hey, you really do need to, to go out and raise some capital. You need to get significant capital behind you to realize this potential. Any tips on how to recognize that situation? Um, any indicators? Well, I, I'll, I'll answer that first uh, by deflecting the answer, and then I'll come back to it. I really encourage lots of people to look at their business and say, is there a way I can get the first mil million in revenue bootstrapping? especially in software, the cost of entry now is so much lower than it was before. Um, but unfortunately, there is a mindset uh, out there, oh, I'm starting a business, I must raise money. Uh, I would encourage, the purpose of why I was so excited to contribute today is don't always think that way. I, I look at so many businesses that I mentor uh, or that I'm an angel investor and I say, you actually don't need to raise money. There's another way to do it. But the heart of your question, Jill, is, you know, what are, the, what are some of the signals to say, oh, when should you raise money? Well, if you're going up uh, with a competitor that has a very strong balance sheet, that could be. But the converse is you look at that competitor and you say, you know what, that competitor is doing it all wrong. Um, and actually, I think I can leapfrog them with a better solution and I can leapfrog them bootstrapping them. Uh, there are a number of tech companies that I know that raise money, but they actually never use the money. They were doing so well, but they raised it just to give them a cushion or whatever. There's one company I was uh, an investor in through our LP and uh, they had a phenomenal exit, but the money they raised from, they never spent. They never spent it. And, and, and I always wondered why they raised money. It was good for us. I mean, as investors, we, we got the upset, but they never actually spent the money they raised from us. Um, so one reason is I think you need to look at um, your competitive landscape. Obviously, if you have supply chain, if you're a hardware company, uh, it's really hard to do a lot of bootstrapping. Uh, unless you can get prepaid purchase orders, uh, but then you got you know run sizes and that. But I, that's so foreign to me. I haven't I I haven't done anything in manufacturing for over 20 years. So um, I will say as a sidebar, when I got involved in manufacturing, just in time manufacturing uh, uh, was the thing, and, and and low cycle times and all that low batch sizes. 
I, I think it's hilarious now they're applying that same methodology to software. Uh, so it's just, for me, it's like, oh, I've seen this story 20 years ago, but now we're applying it to software. Um, so back to the heart of your question, uh, what are some other, I guess, um, what's another reason? Well, if, if you really want to build a billion dollar company, uh, you're going to need capital. But there's a really interesting software company uh, some, many of you may know them, Atlassian out of Australia. They didn't raise a dime, I think, until they were 100 or 200 million in ARR. Now they are a multi-billion dollar company, but they brought in some private equity groups at that stage that really helped them get to a billion dollars. So there, if you, I think if to get to a billion dollars, eventually a billion dollars, you will need outside money uh, to accelerate your growth. Um, I don't know, have I kind of answered the question? Yeah, or? no, I think you really did. I think you really did. And I think the, um, I guess it's one of the things you didn't say, but it's implied in everything you you said is, don't do it, don't do it because you need the money. <laughs> That's a bad signal. <laughs> so do it because you see an opportunity to go faster. So, yeah. and, and if you don't take advantage of that window of time and, and go at that speed, you might lose out. So either because you're looking at your competitors and you see an opportunity or you see an opportunity to own the market, if you can go really fast, or perhaps by bringing in outside investors, you can access uh, networks or connections or customers that you wouldn't otherwise be able to access. Those are all good reasons. And, and I'm glad you brought that up because uh, here I am talking about bootstrapping and I am looking for the first time in under active states um, history uh, under my leadership is I'm seeing, is there a potential investor that we could bring on board that could help us move faster, execute better? Because even, you know, doing what I'm doing for 30 years, I, there's so much I can still learn. And so I'm wondering if there's that type of investor that really gets our space and they have seen some of the um, road bumps that we're going to encounter as we approach 100 million, um, and maybe they can help us uh, uh, navigate those road bumps better than us doing it on our own. So that's a, that to me is a, a good reason potentially to think of bringing outside capital because you want to bring in capital more than just the money. It's uh, to me the money is secondary. Is is there a fit that together you can create something spectacular? Yeah, that's great. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, just, I wanna do a quick look at my audience. I've got one question in the chat, but I just wanna give a quick look out. Does anybody who's on the call have a question that you might wanna ask live? Let me just raise your hand. Nope, okay. I'm gonna go to the chat then. Um, so from Erica, do you think that the current climate, like bearing in mind the economic impacts of COVID, does that make it better or worse? for the bootstrapping model? How would you modify anything that you've said based on, or maybe nothing, based on what's going on today? Yeah, I mean, if, if Erica's question is from the perspective of COVID, uh, for me, uh, it doesn't change. There is so much opportunity right now because of COVID. It's, it's, um, there's opportunity and there's threats. I mean, there are industries that are exploding overnight and there are industries that are tanking overnight, you know, at the same time. Um, uh, I look at, for example, the opportunities in the medical space right now, virtual medicine is just, it's, it, virtual medicine has appeared overnight and there's so much opportunity there. Um, so my, all my things around bootstrapping, if you're in the right vertical, it still applies. It doesn't change. I think you just need to be very careful and look where you're playing, you know, which industries are hurting and which industries are opportunistic. And as we've seen in tech, most of tech, and that was even evident by the survey earlier today, most of the tech is faring the same or better um, uh, during COVID. I mean, we, we for example, at Actistate, we exceeded our, our, our stretch target for Q1, Q2, Q3, we almost hit stretch. Uh, so, you know, we, we've had a really good year, touch wood, relative to many companies out there. 
So to Erica's question, I, I, bootstrapping still is apply if, if there's money in the channel that you're going after and you can solve a real problem, you can extract that money right away. That's great. Um, it's interesting. I actually saw a data point from BC Business Council just last night, and, uh, and it's that they're projecting that BC's economy is going to be down 6.5% this year and then grow by 4.5% next year, um, which is astonishingly good compared to what the early estimates were. So it's just, it's certainly a sober reality check and there's lots of challenge in the economy today, but um, as time passes, you know, some of those impacts aren't quite as bad as we originally saw. And some of the opportunities are definitely there, especially for tech companies. So let's go to another question in the chat. So, uh, so from Kathleen, a uh, company that's projected to hit over a million in revenue. Um, what do you recommend for founders? So it's back to this concept around building a team. So at times it feels isolating. I've considered bringing in some advisors. I've also wondered about starting to invest in that A team and bringing in A team players. Is there any guidance you'd offer here? Any tips, anything to avoid? Yeah, so uh, first of all, at the million dollar level, uh, congratulations for getting to that. That's a huge accomplishment. Um, at the million dollar level, uh, if you have a group of founders at the, uh, you know, probably there is, there's one person, Kathleen, that should be the CEO and that's calling the shots, but then now you need to start expanding the team a little bit. And I often say to that founding group, you need to treat yourself as, yes, you're a shareholder founder, but that's different than a, the operating role that you play. And you need to separate the two. But as the CEO of this founding group, um, I fundamentally believe as a CEO, you should always surround yourself with advisors. I've had advisors through my whole career. You should not be alone. And you can get those advisors in different ways, shapes, or forms. Um, I can tell you what I've done. Um, I've had business mentor coaches or business mentors, but I've also had, and, and those business mentors change based on the situation of where you are and the scale of your business. But one thing I've had common throughout all my career is an executive coach. And that's different than a business mentor. The business mentor is helping you with the business. The executive coach is helping you with this. Your, your fears, your doubts, your, your blind spots, your strengths. And it, the, the business, sorry, the executive coach gives you a safe place to talk about things you may not be able to talk about with your employees, with your founders. Um, uh, they're almost an extension of your spouse in a way. I, I would like to be, I have a wonderful relation with my wife and I can share anything with her. Um, but when it comes to business, she doesn't necessarily want to hear that. But with a bit, with a, with an executive coach, you should be able to have that trust, that safe place to explore those things. So the point I'm trying to make, Kathleen, advice to you is you should surround yourself with some people through the whole journey, but those people will change based on your needs. It has to be based on your needs. And there's nothing wrong with saying to somebody, you know what, you've served a great purpose, but now I need something different. Um, and so I really enco encourage you to get that coaching. It doesn't necessarily need to be a board, but you talk about as you're going from a million to five million, don't do it alone. You should always have people around you. And it's just, there's, and, and sorry, and of course there's a board. You want to have board. You can have, advisors. I have a group of people. You want to just talk to people and you just take your topic and you go to the right person to talk about that topic. And But you need to pick the topic and the right person. That's your job to figure out and then make it happen. That's wonderful uh, advice, Bart. And I 100% um, endorse it. And I'd also encourage people to think about um, peer councils. Those can also be useful at different times because uh, the opportunity to share with others who've had experiences, how did you tackle this problem? 
Um, so RC councils do that, but there's other groups as well, but that's a really useful piece to put in. I, I could, I've, I've done that many times over my career. The, you know, the round table, CEO round tables are really, really powerful. Great. Okay. So that was definitely helpful. Uh, and as Kathleen says, I think my husband will thank you as well. <laughs> <laughs> he no longer has to be the executive coach. Okay, great. Um, well, we're sort of nearing the end of our time here. So let me just check. Is there any other questions that anyone else has on the phone? I've got one final question for Bart, but does anyone else have any questions? Okay. So, so Bart here, uh, just to give our, our group some closing words. Okay. So if you had uh, one piece of advice, if there was one takeaway that you wanted them to take away from today, one thing you would emphasize, what would that be? I want to go back to an earlier point I made that I, I feel very passionate about as an owner operator is that in order to make your business a success, you are, you are all in. You have a, a bet, basically a bet of one, one bet. When you ask other investors to get involved, uh, they have multiple bets. So their behavior is different than your behavior. And it should be. Um, so it's important that you get investors that understand that you have one bet. And this is the problem I have with the VC industry is they put so much pressure on the founder to take enormous risks for your baby. But they, they know it's a numbers game and a, a number of them will fail. So my words of advice is if, that, if that's the game you want to play, remember there's a misalignment and I don't like that misalignment. And, and just think hard about that. Um, <clears throat> that's my words of advice. And, and as one person said to me, Bart, your, your N equals one. My N equals 20, meaning the number of bets. I think that's really profound. Yeah, we, we, it's, it's our baby and we want our baby to succeed and never second guess yourself about that. Get different perspectives. But your baby is your baby and uh, make it be a success. It's your one bet. Okay, listen, this has been absolutely tremendous, Bart. I really, really appreciate you taking the time with us today. Um, really valuable advice and insights. I know everyone's really going to appreciate it. Thank you very much. Well, my pleasure. And if I've, I've left, if, you know, for me, my, my goal is if I've left somebody with just one little inspiration, then I consider that a success. Mm -hmm.